how I want to start is basically talking about, before we even talk about our architecture and what we're doing, I want to talk about who our users are. Um, when we go talk to companies, there's usually three groups of folks who are in the room that we talk to. And each of, what we need to understand is that the different users have different needs and they actually use completely different types of software. So if you design something for just one group of users, it tends not to permeate, then you get these silos in your organization. So usually what we see is the three kind of groups in there are developers, um, analytics teams, and of course a lot of the folks who are in the room here, you know, infrastructure engineering. And when we talk to those users, they have wildly different priorities and use cases. When we talk to developers, and I know there's a lot of talks here about this, but really continuous delivery containers is really one of the biggest things they have. Breaking up their application into microservices. Uh, mobile first, which means that they're moving everything towards API centric. When we start talking to big data folks, which is almost a completely different world, right? They're JVM, they're using things like um, one of the biggest trends we're seeing right now is streaming analytics coming out. Tools like Kafka, um, NoSQL databases, unstructured data. We're seeing a lot of machine learning. So before when analytics teams were you know, using things like SAS to talk to an Oracle database, when you see new companies now, they're using Spark to talk to Cassandra. And finally, infrastructure folks. Um, they usually get beat up in these meetings. Like when we go to companies, it's like the developers are like, why is infrastructure so slow? But when we talk to infrastructure folks, it's like, how do we accelerate our deployments? How do we move to the cloud? Right? So what we have is you know, tensions. We have different kinds of use cases, and we often have IT being a blocker, because what we're moving to is very complex. So that's what I just want you to think about. When we talk about the software that we develop, we're thinking about who are the users that we're trying to serve. And another thing that we're seeing is really there's an explosion in new tools. You know, Since we're moving pretty much open source first, I, I mean, how many folks here, like, is primarily open source. That's the first thing you use before anything else. Yeah, so it's it's actually getting much more common. Um, there's a lot of companies that will only start doing open source and they'll use proprietary if they absolutely have to. Um, and what we're seeing here just in a lot of ways is there's extreme amounts of specialization, right? So you'll have, you know, Spark is really becoming like, we went from Map, Hadoop Mapper used to Spark and now there's things like Flink coming up. In the data space, what we're seeing is very specialized data stores you know, that they're good for just a single use case. And finally, um, there's been some talk about Docker, but really what we're seeing is that the runtime is changing from like static-based services towards these schedulers, right? So this is just within, and virtually all these tools have showed up within the last few years. So what we're seeing is just an explosion of the number of new tools. And that's kind of the root of our problem, is that infrastructure is getting too complex. And this is not a problem that we're going to be able to solve because everything is multiplying. Um, how many folks here use Amazon? Okay, we have a few. So for the folks who haven't, when you log into Amazon, like you know, your company says, hey, we want to move to the cloud. And you log into Amazon, you get presented something like this. And when you're thinking about traditional IT of rolling up servers, it's this thing up here, right? EC2. And the rest of Amazon stuff is insane. And just configuring this is a pain in itself because when you want to do networking, anybody who's had to start with Amazon knows that. So the first thing is like, even before you can start running all those complex applications, you just, there's a huge amount of complexity there. And then when you start getting to the applications, like for an IoT application, this is just one part of the configuration for Apache Kafka. And we see for a lot of IoT systems, like reference platforms, there's like 10 or 12 different components, right? So you can spend, and this is just, Security, high availability. So when we say things are getting too complex, that's a problem. Multiplying systems, each which have their own HA and configuration. Um, and IT can't keep up. So I like to use this. This is kind of how we do IT today, right? This is almost painful to watch. There's a lot of me, you know, just banging away at it. And then when we hear about companies like Google and people at these talks here, how everything sounds so awesome in the future, you know, this is, you know, going from 62 seconds to 1.5 seconds. Right? And the thing is that this is an enormous investment, right? Like uh, Netflix has a tool called Spinnaker, which is an automated build tool, and they have eight engineers in Silicon Valley just working on that, which is probably an investment of $3 million a year, you know, just for that. So it's a ridiculously expensive to develop your own software. So that's kind of the whole idea of Mantle. You know, it's infrastructure is getting too complex. We don't think that IT can keep up. You know, and one of the things about IT not being able to keep up is that I think for a lot, since this is a DevOps-centric conference, kind of home for me, um, most organizations only have like one or two people who are good at this. 
you know, we're going to actually do DevOps. And they have to be responsible for everything. So they spend all their time just trying to keep up. And finally, the investment to do this on your own, to have your own Snowflake infrastructure is ridiculously expensive. So that's kind of the idea of Mantle. Like, what if we can make an open source project that automates a lot of these base tactics, that makes it really easy to do things like Kubernetes and Mesos and a lot of other common things that most companies want to run, and if we could have it spin up in a few minutes. That's the whole idea of the project. So the project's name is Mantle. Um, it's sponsored by Cisco. So Cisco's using this as a reference platform for their customers, right? So Cisco's basing their internal systems on this. Um, and when they go to a customer, like you buy a UCS rack, you'll be able to install Mantle on it, and they'll have the thing. So it's like a software platform that kind of Cisco could present, because Cisco's very big into IoT. So, you know, but to spin that up for their customers can take a year or two, so that doesn't do them any good. So this is kind of like a reference platform to get it up in a few minutes. Um, and obviously, we are large committers to the project. We're the, we're the number one committers to the project, so Cisco has hired us to develop most of it. Um, and just some of the things it installs and minutes to most clouds. Uh, we support diverse workloads because our feeling is that open source tools have a lifetime of about three to five years. So the stuff we do today is going to be obsolete. Um, we build in things like high availability, security, uh, ACLs, things like that. And finally, it's open source. We're very focused on having an open community, so it's an Apache to a license. Right, that's enough about it. Let's start talking about the architecture. Just got to get here on time. All right. The first thing, if you're running any kind of this new infrastructure that you're talking about, whether it's Kubernetes or Mesos, usually what you'll see is um, you're going to have a group of nodes called control nodes. And these are, your, these are the things that actually coordinate the work across your cluster. So when you deploy a Mantle cluster or Kubernetes or something like that, you're going to want three or five of these control nodes. And then there's a pool of resource nodes that basically do the work for you, right? So what happens is these send work out to the workers, right? And if one of these goes down, all the work that was on it goes somewhere else. So this is a common pattern that we're seeing. And finally, we have these two nodes called edge nodes, which are optional. And basically, these are put at the edge of your infrastructure, and they dynamically route traffic into your containers. So if that makes sense. So we have three different types of roles. And then when we talk about the stack, this is basically, and this is not Mantle specific, this is going to be if you're using Kubernetes or Docker Swarm or anything like that, when you start moving to modern containerized deployments, you're going to have an entire list of things that you're going to need to do. So this is one of the first shocks when people move to Docker, right? When they run it on their desktop, it's super easy and fun to do, but when you want to run it into production, suddenly things get very complicated. Um, so I'm going to walk through all these, but I just wanted to talk about this, because um, these are all the components that we put into Mantle, and we kind of all make them work together. Um, so, just so everybody knows, um, first thing is cloud provisioning, how we provision our hosts, uh, overlink network, which I'm probably not going to cover here due to time, uh, service discovery, secret store, um, there's schedulers, right, where this is the Kubernetes Mesa space, and then UI API, and finally how we get traffic into that. So we're going to walk through this, we're going to start from the bottom here, and we're going to kind of walk through here and talk about the decisions that we made on the platform and why we're doing it that way. Kind of, so that'll be the rest of our talk. So the first part is cloud provisioning. Um, and we're using a tool. So one of the nice things about Mantle is that we get to pick whatever tools we want. It's almost like a Red Hat model that we take open source tools and integrate them together so that they work. Um, so the first tool we use is a tool called Terraform. And we use Terraform to basically abstract out the underlying cloud. So once Mantle, Mantle looks about 95% the same on Amazon or OpenStack or Google Cloud or DigitalOcean, right? So if you've never used Terraform before, it's a pretty slick tool for automating the deployment of infrastructure. So we have a series of Terraform rules that basically allows us to deploy to multiple clouds. And when we do our automated testing, we test against four different clouds right now. So we can spin these clusters up and bring them down in about 20 minutes. And we're trying to speed that up. But that's the first thing. So the first thing we do is we really want to abstract out where you're running this, whether it's on-premise or on your cloud, because that's usually a big limiting factor. And just so you know what Terraform looks like, it's a little bit like a good version of cloud formation. Um, I don't know how many folks could read this, right? But what you do is you define resources and blocks. So here what we do is we're going to decide. So one of the biggest pains in Amazon is like set up a VPC, right? We could usually set this up and make it repeatable. And we could have variables in here like this. So we could have multiple VPCs you know, with different subnets. So what we do is. We set the VPC, we put a variable into it, and then we like can tag it automatically, right, with variables. And the cool thing about this is when we create other dependent resources, they could just take the VPC ID. So it's extremely easy to take 
like your exact infrastructure that you have like running in one Amazon region and just change one variable and duplicate the entire thing on another region. And we could have this up. Usually the Terraform provisioning of our clouds is under two minutes just to get all the hosts. So that goes everything from S3 buckets to networks to security groups and everything. Everything is completely automated using Terraform. So that's kind of the first thing. If you get anything out of this talk, probably look at Terraform first for deploying your infrastructure. It's pretty slick. Um, and there's cool stuff we could do about this. Since Terraform has multiple backend modules because it's pretty cloud agnostic, what we could do is have Terraform Amazon instances dynamically register themselves into the Cloudflare, which is a completely different provider. It's not Route 53. And what we do in Mantle is we dynamically, remember when I talked about those edge nodes before? When we provision those, we could actually, if you see this variable for edge IP4 list, we dynamically create a wildcard. So every time we bring up new edge nodes, they dynamically get traffic automatically. So that's the kind of stuff we could do with Terraform. Um, we also do things with Terraform like attached Docker, like external EBS to systems. So we could have a separate Docker volume just for that with an overlay file system. So there's, because we have a good, uh, really good deployment story, we can do really lots of slick things on the infrastructure that would usually take you a lot of time. And it's all variable driven, so it's very flexible. All right, I know, and I just want to tell everybody, I'm going to put these slides up because there's a lot here. If you've not experienced any of this before, it's a little overwhelming, but I just kind of want to get everybody the idea of how we do this. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is service discovery. How many folks have um, heard of the term service discovery or Netflix, Eureka, or anything like that? Okay. So I'm going to assume. So basically, when we start moving to these containerized applications, like with things like Docker, um, if you remember in the old days, you know, or even today, like you would fix IP list, you would have someone automatically, you know, manually put things into DNS. When we move to microservices, your applications could be running anywhere inside that Mantle cluster, and you don't know where it is. So how do applications find each other, right? Like how does a user service find a pricing service? Um, we built in a service discovery engine at Demantle, so every task that you launch within the cluster automatically registers itself within there so that things are automatically. Um, the service discovery information is exposed via DNS. So every system could just do a DNS call to find out where the service is. So if there's a username service, like you want to know somebody's username, you just go to, you just do DNS to username service and it automatically finds it. Um, and it's really kind of, um, this is really becoming critical to next generation infrastructure. So this is what it looks like if you're using DNS. Like let's say that you have a Kafka cluster somewhere in your, you know, and you want to use it. Uh, you don't want to hard code anything. So basically, when you spin up your clients, you just tell them to talk to, you know, Dev Kafka service, service, and then it comes back with the IPs. And these IPs are dynamically populated wherever your Kafka is running in your cluster. Just to give you an idea of what it looks like. So you can start seeing this starts making your internal configurations very simple and dynamic, as opposed to before where you might be putting in hard-coded host names or hard-coded IPs. Now when you fire up a container, you just say, hey, I just want to talk to x.service, and I'll find it within the cluster. So this is built in. Again, this is kind of, what we're trying to do is common patterns that you would do yourself that might take many months. We're just saying this could be, it's just built into the system. And we're using console for this, which is a really cool service discovery system. And one things we do in Mantle is, we set up things like ACL. So the problem is if you set up console yourself, you may not have to do HA, you may not have to do SSL. Uh, we, have SSL we have ACLs enabled, right? Otherwise, anybody could register a service. Um, we've built tools around this, like Mesos console, which every time you launch a Mesos task, it automatically launches a console. And we're working with uh, HashiCorp and Google to uh, integrate Kubernetes service discovery with console. So we'll have a single service discovery backend. Right, so that's kind of one of our goals with Mantle. Remember when we talked about that we didn't want to be too dependent on a vendor. We want to have common patterns that anybody could use so that if you're running a task in Kubernetes, you could just say look up x.service and it will automatically be routed to something running in Mesos. And I'll talk about why we have a difference between Kubernetes and Mesos in a little bit. Another cool thing about console is that health checks are built in. A lot of times now that people don't really monitor their infrastructure, right? They use something like Nagios or Sensei on the outside. Console could actually embed health checks in. And if the thing fails a health check, it'll pull it out of service discovery. So when we deploy things on Mantle, every service that we deploy on the system itself, on the OS that's not containerized, we actually add a health check into it. So you can actually, the cluster actually knows the state of everything that's running on it. And it's super easy to add new services to check. You just drop a JSON into the console directory and reload it. Right, so suddenly, 
you know, we could check a marathon's running, and if it's not running, we pull it out of DNS. So it's something cool too, again, like something that people don't really do well, really well is infrastructure monitoring, but Mantle checks itself. And we also do something else. We wrote this tool called Distributed, which I think should get a lot more. It's, um, if you ever use like server spec for Ruby where you test the configuration, um, Distributed is really dumb and simple. Basically, it's a go binary, and you give it a JSON that says, this is what I want to see on my system. Like, I want to see this file exist with these permissions, this system D service, right? That's all it does. Like, so we use it to unit test our clusters when we bring them up. We just run, you know, run this binary against this JSON for this test suite. Now the cool thing about this is that we integrate this with console. So basically the system checks itself every 60 seconds to see if anything's been misconfigured and it feeds it into the health checks. And the console health checks are supposed to be an API, so you can just do a single API call to see if anything's misconfigured on your entire cluster. So this is just cool in itself. You don't have to use anything else, but I just think for like finding any drift in your systems, this is really cool. All right. How are we doing time-wise? Um, let's see what the next thing is. If folks haven't run Docker before, one of the biggest problems is getting secrets into your Docker containers. It's there's a lot of hacks around it, and people do like ad hoc things, like they'll pull, you know, when a system boots, they'll pull SSL certs from a, something like a Amazon S3, or they'll copy it manually, or they'll put it into property files, but you're not supposed to have any secret data within your Docker containers. They're supposed to be immutable, so somehow you have to have them on the host system itself, and that usually is really kind of a hacky ad hoc process. Um, we're using a tool called HashiCorp Vault, if you've ever used about it, and we just released the 1.0 of a VaultFS plugin, What's really cool about this, so Vault is just a generic secret store that's getting to be really popular, but what we've developed is a tool called VaultFS, and when you launch a Docker container, you basically, it mounts a virtual file system that like at slash secret or something like that, and they'll actually have your secrets in it. So a developer doesn't need to know anything. They just launch their container, and the system automatically wires it, and since it's in memory, it's not on the host itself, so when you're doing like, you know, hundreds of hosts that are running Mantle, your secrets could be anywhere. So again, this is kind of, this would be an old, old talk in itself. Actually, each one of these topics is probably a whole crazy talk in itself, but I just wanted to talk about the architecture of when you start moving to using things like Docker, all the things you're gonna have to mess with that we've seen from customers in the past, right? Like things get incredibly complex very fast and you end up hacking things just to get it to work. I wanna talk about schedulers next because this is kind of the big thing that's coming around right now. Um, we just had some from Elastic folks that were talking you know, about scheduling and doing dynamic things, and you've probably heard a lot about Kubernetes, and if you're in the Docker space, you've heard about Swarm, um, there's Apache Mesos, so um, we have this entire new class of applications that are called schedulers that you know, basically break up work. <coughs> and if you don't really know what it is, is if you look at like a traditional server environment, um, your servers are broken up in static. It's called static partitioning. You might have a few database servers, you have a few web servers, and everything is separated from everything else. And when you do your deployments, you probably have like custom, you know, chef puppets, salt scripts to do each one of those roles. <coughs> when you move to these cluster managers, what you have is the servers are basically, they could be, they're almost disposable. This is the Google model of compute that's moving on to everything. And your servers, you know, if something dies, the work will migrate somewhere else. And then you have this application called the cluster manager that manages all the work. So you hit an API here and talk to the cluster manager and say, I want to launch this much work on these systems. And it's responsible for making sure that that many copies run. So if you're running like a web application and you want three copies running, you launch it and you say, hey, I want three copies of this running. And if one of those goes down, Kubernetes will notice that and we'll restart it or Mesos will do the same. So this, these cluster managers are kind of a really hot space right now. Just. So in Mantle, we support two schedulers currently. The uh, first one we started with is Mesos. Um, Mesos is very good for data-centric workloads. So things like uh, Spark was developed to use Mesos as a backend for compute, uh, Cassandra, Elasticsearch, Kafka, um, you know, HDFS, kind of data-centric workloads work really well on Mesos. Um, on the other hand, remember we talked about that cultural split? Uh, Kubernetes is really on the Docker side. And if you talk to like you know, Docker Kubernetes folks, they're really not, they're, they're starting to get like, there's just some demos of Spark on Kubernetes, but it's not really there yet. Not like it is on the big data side. And this is a cultural thing, right? Because the container people are not the data people. 
Um, so we have Kubernetes 1 2, which just came out, and we're also, um, we have Calico integration working, so we actually have a single network that talks between Kubernetes and Mesos and an overlay network. So basically, the idea is you actually have different workers that are doing different workloads. And we integrate those at several points. Uh, service discovery, we're integrating at a console level, uh, overlay networks, deployment and management, and also load balancing. So we'll have a load balancer that actually can talk to Kubernetes or Mesos for your different jobs. So this is what the Mantle interface looks like right now. Um, one thing you'll notice is that we have health checks built right into the system. So as you bring up new things, it automatically populates. Like if you bring up Elasticsearch or, or Kafka or something, it'll automatically come in here and show up. And since we build in health checks, you can see if anything's failing right from the UI. Now the UI too is if you look at like a lot of open source projects, they don't have any security around the UIs or GUIs. So we have an authenticated SSL UI through a single port. And another thing is data applications that are pretty, like if you ever wanted to set up like a Kafka cluster or Elasticsearch, it's again, you're getting into the Shepherd puppet. But since we're using Mesos frameworks, we have a single API call that we run to launch things. Like let's say you want to launch a Cassandra cluster. You just talk to one of the control nodes and you just say, hey, post name Cassandra. And it'll bring up the Mesos framework that runs Cassandra. So you can do the same thing with Elasticsearch and Kafka. So with one command, once the cluster is up, it's very easy to bring up these frameworks. So that's kind of, and this is a Mantle API, and basically this takes, um, you know, these are the frameworks that we support right now. We're actually doing really well on time, so I'm zipping through this. <laughs> um, load balancing is another big one. Uh, we talked about the edge nodes, right? How do you get traffic in? So we talked about one thing we did was we dynamically update DNS with the hosts that are edge servers. Now the other thing too is, since this work can come up on any node at any time, how do we get traffic in there in a dynamic way? We're using a tool called Traffic, which is written by a gentleman in France. Uh, we saw it over the summer, we thought it was really great, so we decided to use it instead of a custom HA proxy. So when we started the project, we were using a custom HA proxy that was rewriting rules, and I think a lot of people start that way. We found it didn't scale past you know, 150 applications. Um, so we found this application, and it's pretty slick. It's just a Go binary that goes and queries different backends and dynamically routes traffic. Uh, so the UI looks like this, and you can see here, you know, there's a Docker container here. These are the different front ends, right? And then you just go back and it says, these are all the servers that it's running in. So now the cool thing about this is one thing we really believe is more empowering our developers so when a developer launches an application, they attach some metadata in the JSON, like if they're launching a Mesos task, and it's down here. I don't know if everybody can see this, but it's the front end value, right? So traffic will match the HTTP headers coming in. So when a developer launches an app, they could actually just say, hey, match this URL or this DNS name. And the developer could say how the application is really routed on the inside. So instead of asking an IT person to create some firewall rules, it's all dynamic. Um, it includes WebSocket, SNI support, it's about to get Let's Encrypt support, um, and traffic is also, the Kubernetes PR is almost ready to be merged, so that we could use a single front end for the different backends. And this is all dynamic, so you could say don't enable, like if you're launching a task, you could say I don't want to expose this via the load balancer, so you say you know, enable equals false, and the developer can control that. So again, we, so that's how we get traffic inside our infrastructure. And since we have time, I'm able to talk about, um, I don't know if I'm overlaying or working here. So if you use Docker, you might have heard about like Docker networking at some point. So one of the things that the Google folks have learned and that pretty much anybody who runs container-based workloads is when you first start using Docker, it brings up applications on random ports that then you have to map. Um, now the cool thing about console is console picks all that up and says, hey, this app is running on this port, and it exposes it via something called DNS SRV records, right? So if you have your container running on 10 different servers on 10 different ports, when you do the DNS request, it'll come back with those different ports. The problem is that most applications don't understand that. Uh, a lot of folks put proxies in between. It tends to be pretty brittle because the proxies are not, you know, they could be out of date. So if you look at what Kubernetes is doing in Docker networking and Mesos IP per container, is that Every container gets put on this virtual network. Again, so this is something else you have to configure. Um, so we partnered with 
uh, MetaSwitch on Project Calico for Mesos, and we actually have uh, Kubernetes and Mesos working on the same overlay network so that they can talk to each other. So when you bring this up, you can actually have the processes. So we're trying to get that. So if you see how we're trying to get it together is that they could work together, they could be on the same network, they could use the same service discovery, and they could use the same ingress load balancer. <coughs> All right, I zip through that, okay. Well, that's pretty much a summary of our project. We're at mantle.io, uh, GitHub, Cisco Cloud. As I said before, we're really passionate about open source. Um, we have over 2,000 stars on GitHub. We have new committers joining all the time. We'd love if you could try it out and commit. We have a, a Gitter chat, which is basically an IRC chat that you could, people get support on in real time, just on the front page itself. Um, so I feel like it's pretty exciting for me that I get to work on an open source project and uh, build a community around it. And that's it. Thank you.